Hello and welcome to today's webinar on Uncovering the Hidden Value of IoT with Device Management. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I'm Editorial Director and Co-Founder of IoT Now, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. And I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us all around the world. We've got a great discussion for you, brought to you in association with Wind River and backed up by independent analysis from Beecham Research. So the first thing to do is to introduce you to our speakers. They are Robin Duke Woolley, analyst and CEO of Beecham Research, who will be speaking first. Hello, Robin. Hello, Jeremy. Good to, uh, good to talk to you today. Thanks for coming. It's also my pleasure to welcome Joel Emery, who is Vice President of Wind River Helix Management Platform. Great to have you here, Joel. Hello, Jeremy. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to our discussion today. Well, me too. Today we are going to be looking at device management as the hidden ingredient for success in the Internet of Things, or shall we just call that IoT. This will give us an overview of life in real IoT deployments, and we can talk about the challenges and the risks and explore some connecting existing devices and new services. Many of you will be familiar with the way this works, so you'll know that this webinar is being recorded and you can access it in 48 hours via iot-now.com. Before we start, let me just say that we really want to know what you think. So start sending us your questions right now, and then after the presentations, I will put your questions to our panel. If you want to do that, just click on the questions button and type your query into the window. And I'll put as many of them to our speakers as time allows. Wind River slides will also be made available after the webinar. And finally, if you're having any technical issues with audio or slides, you can also use the question window to get advice from our technical support team. Well, the first thing that we wanted to do today was to go to a poll question. As I said, this is interactive. We want to make sure that we understand what your state of play is. And the first question that we'd like you to answer is, what phase of IoT development are you in? Is it consideration? Are you in development? Are you close to deployment? Have you deployed but now facing challenges? Or are you successfully deployed and preparing for future releases? So just click on the button, the radio button beside the one that most closely corresponds to your situation. What phase of IoT development are you in? Consideration, in development, close to deployment, deployed but with challenges, or finally successfully deployed and now preparing for future releases. Hopefully that gives you enough time to give us your thoughts. Let's have a look and see what the answers are. Well, by some margin, there seems to be nearly four out of ten uh, are c in consideration of an IoT deployment. 28.6% uh, in development. The next 16.3% have successfully deployed, that's encouraging, preparing for future releases. 10.2% deployed and facing challenges, and 6% close to deployment, but the overwhelming number are considering. Um, Joel, can I ask you first, is that in line with your expectations? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's really interesting to see the, uh, the number of, uh, it, it, it's as expected, a lot of people are considering, but also uh, the, uh, the deployments have started and are starting to, to ramp up. So it's very, con it's very consistent with, uh, with what we see on our side. 
how, how do you view that, Robin? Is that the same for you? Yes, indeed. I think that's uh, uh, pretty pretty typical. I think it's good to have uh, a large number of uh, in consideration uh, listening in uh, because there's uh, lots of uh, useful stuff I think they can pick up from uh, from this webinar. But it's also interesting that uh, there are 16% uh, uh, fully deployed or deployed with challenges. Um, clearly, they're looking for more uh, information about uh, how they should move forward. So I think that's good yeah. as well. Yeah, I agree. Okay, let's crack on with the webinar. Um, I certainly want to hear more from our panel, and I'm sure the audience do. So let's turn first to you, Robin, if we may. Um, as a, I say, Robin is from Beecham Research, and once yes. he's spoken, Robin will hand straight over to Joel Emery from Wind River. Robin, the stage is yours. That's great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeremy. So uh, this is just a, a title slide. So moving to uh, my, my first slide, this is um, just an outline of the um, M2M and, and IoT market in terms of um, applications and, and sectors, so nine key sectors in the center there. And then at the outside of it are uh, uh, devices that could be connected. Um, now, this depicts also uh, the start of the um, M2M uh, market, the start of the connected devices market, and uh, it's a, a more of an M2M application. So we're looking at um, uh, data at the uh, external, at the edge of the, of the network, uh, and then uh, a silo type of uh, um, uh, activity uh, to the center. Um, and I want to draw a distinction between that, which has been uh, where the marketplace started uh, many years ago, and uh, is, uh, there's, there's still an awful lot of uh, M2M applications uh, out in the marketplace. But now we're beginning to move on to um, uh, the uh, IoT type of uh, situation where we have um, more than one uh, source. Uh, they may be in similar sectors or they may be in different sectors. Um, and the aim is to then uh, bring all that information together uh, at the center uh, into a, a sort of construct with um, several applications and, and several data sets. Um, and the idea there is that uh, you get a, a richer view of uh, what is going on, uh, more control, uh, more understanding, uh, and more insight into uh, how to move things forward. So this is really the essence of, uh, of an IoT application or an IoT solution compared with uh, an M2M one, which uh, has really, as I say, been uh, where the market for connected devices um, started. Uh, and then, of course, um, moving that on um, very sort of uh, shortly into uh, that area at the center is, of course, the, uh, the middleware for uh, IoT platforms. And that's really what this uh, webinar is about. Uh, so the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about IoT platforms, why, why we have them, and then uh, introduce uh, device management so that we can then go across to, to Joel, who is going to talk in much more depth about the uh, opportunities that uh, device management have, uh, particularly with the, uh, the Wind River solution. So um, moving on then to um, the next slide, the objectives of, of IoT platforms. Um, so it's an intelligent layer that connects the, uh, the things uh, to the network and abstracts the applications from the things in order to enable the development of uh, services. And why do we want all that? Why do we want to do this? Um, well, we really want to achieve three main objectives, or, or four if you split out the last one. Um, flexibility, we want to be able to deploy things in uh, different types of solutions, different constructs. We want uh, flexibility, as much flexibility as possible to um, uh, deploy in different ways. Um, we also want to make it um, easy to use. Um, the user experience is very, very important. What we found with uh, uh, M2M uh, applications in the early days is that uh, if it's not well defined and if it's not made simple for the user, then it's not particularly effective in its use. Um, so it's very important that uh, usability is uh, top of the uh, top of the ranking, if you like, of things that need to be done. And then, of course, there's productivity. Well, why do it in the first place? Why do you, uh, how can you justify uh, the use of it um, from a, a business perspective? We want to uh, enable service creation in order to improve efficiency uh, and reduce costs. 
but also enable new service development, which could be about increasing revenue. So uh, those two, um, as I say, could be split out as, as separate things, one to reduce costs and, and, and one to increase revenue. But the objectives are pretty clear from that. And there's going to be more about uh, those um, elements uh, in, the, in the next presentation from, uh, from Joel. So then, uh, what, is a, what is an IoT platform look like? Uh, well, this is a macro view of uh, an IoT platform. And we've done it in a series of layers. So we start at the bottom with uh, sensors, actuators, devices, gateways, the things that need to be connected. Um, and then we have network infrastructure, the connectivity to, uh, to make that uh, connection. And then the communication service layer, which is basically um, providing the management for the uh, connectivity. And then we have uh, the device management uh, on top of that, which is what this webinar is, is all about. Um, uh, so we'll be talking more about that uh, uh, throughout. Uh, and then above that, uh, data management, so the storage, the modeling, the uh, analytics, and so forth. And then the application development layer, and on top of that, the application itself. So there's lots of different layers that uh, are required uh, from a user perspective to have, uh, to have a, a full solution. At the same time, we have um, various horizontal um, uh, activities. Uh, security, for example, which is uh, a requirement at each layer, uh, different um, requirements for different layers. But also we need to bear in mind that um, there is a need for security not only at each layer, but between each layer as well. And then there's API management, which kind of goes together with that, because uh, that is uh, interacting, for example, with um, different uh, systems in uh, different um, sectors uh, and so forth, and the security required uh, with that, uh, and basically making sure that uh, the um, uh, data can flow between different layers. So as solutions become more complex and mission critical, uh, platforms to support them uh, also need to evolve. Uh, and there's a need to extend the managed environment to the edge. Um, it's not just about cloud. It's about what happens at the edge and the cloud uh, together. And it's becoming more challenging uh, for enterprise users to, to grow their own. This was uh, very much the uh, situation with uh, M2M in the early days that uh, enterprise uh, users um, felt that they could uh, do this stuff in-house. Um, but uh, it's becoming more complex now. And when you start to look at an IoT solution with uh, information and data coming from uh, lots of different directions, it's much better to uh, start to think about outsourcing that to uh, a best fit or uh, most appropriate partner. And then um, because there's going to be a very rapid increase in numbers of connected devices and the diversity of those devices, lots of things connected, um, it means that device management uh, is critical uh, and will become even more critical uh, over time. So um, <clears throat> a, a last slide is, is really trying to summarize uh, some of the key trends in, in, in IoT that uh, uh, are related to the need for device management. Now, we've all seen uh, lots of forecasts indicating very large numbers of connected devices by uh, 2020 uh, and beyond. Um, there's no doubt, I think, that however much you believe those numbers and, uh, and uh, whether you know, any particular number is right or not, there are going to be an awful lot of connected devices out there, many more than there are now. Uh, so there is a need to um, control those, to uh, provide support for those. And there'll be a wide variety of those, uh, including a wide variety of, of sensors even. Um, so at every level, there's a huge new variety is going to be out there. And there will increasingly be uh, intelligence at the edge. Um, it's not just about uh, cloud. It's uh, cloud processing integrated with what's going on at the edge. And there will be direct device-to-device -device communication as well going on at the edge. So quite complex things uh, in future going on at the edge. And we need that to get uh, latency down to make sure that there is direct response to some of these applications, um, while cloud processing will be required for, uh, for others. <clears throat> and then IoT solutions are becoming and will become more mission critical uh, as reliance on these uh, increases. Uh, and that's very consistent with the previous point of having uh, more going on at the edge. 
But IoT is also a learning process. Um, it's uh, as we learn more about the devices and what they can do and what they need to do, uh, there's more of a need to provide remote updates and security enhancements to those devices. They need to be properly managed, in other words, uh, to uh, evolve the uh, overall solutions uh, in the environment. And then there's also a need to support uh, multiple operating systems on, uh, on single platforms um, because uh, you, know, you need to bring together and interoperate between uh, different um, uh, activities uh, as much as possible in the IoT space. Now those and uh, other issues uh, point to device management uh, remaining critical as um, IoT evolves. And I'm now going to uh, hand over to uh, Joel Emery at, uh, at uh, Wind River, who's going to take this uh, a step deeper into uh, what that means and uh, what the opportunities are for device management. So over to you, Joel. Excellent. Thank you very much, Robin, for, uh, for this, uh, uh, this first part of the webinar. So today I'd like to, uh, to talk about the uh, device management as we, we discussed uh, so far and really to focus on the fact that it is a, a hidden ingredient for success in, in IoT. Before we go into the, um, uh, the details, uh, I would like to, uh, to, to really ask a, a, an initial question, which is, why do we want to connect devices? This is, a, this is something that we, we talk about IoT, we're going to talk to connect devices, but what, why do we want to do it? And the reason we want to do it is to access information, information that is stored on these devices, information that is coming from sensors. It can be prepackaged, it can be pre-interpreted, but it's information that is, until we connect these devices, is no, not available to us. Once we have this information, we want to, uh, we have a few options. We can reduce our operating expenses, which is uh, a, a, a very good value proposition for the ecosystem, for customers, and depending on, on what the, the company uh, that you are in is focusing on, or to create to give the ability to create new business model and generate new revenue streams. So let's look at some examples. Examples of situations where we want to connect devices. In this first example, we connect existing devices. That means these are already deployed. They're in the field. So back to our poll at the beginning of this call, some of you may be in that situation that you have uh, successfully deployed devices. Maybe they are connected uh, with some uh, some technology today, and you're looking at uh, what else you want to do in the future with these devices. Here, as an example, we have a company that is uh, providing point of sales terminals. These point of sales terminals need to be provided for end users to do transactions. Any downtime is uh, a loss of business for the end customer, and SLAs must be met uh, in order to avoid fines for the uh, terminal provider. So obviously these devices need to be up and running at all times. From a customer perspective, the end user, they need to be able to transact, and from a terminal provider, they need to be able to meet the SLA at minimum cost. Right? That's, that's an example of pretty straightforward need to connect devices and what is the value proposition behind it. In the next example, we have a new solution uh, where devices maybe don't even exist today. Devices will be created uh, for a very specific deployment purpose. In this case, let's take a medical company. A medical company deploying devices uh, to provide remote care services. So what it does is um, it, uh, because they are connected, there is an ability now to provide new services and charge for premium. There's also an opportunity to save cost and so to have in the value chain a good value proposition that will generate new business opportunities. There's also the need, 
especially when we talk about medical, it would be the same if we talked about other segments such as aviation, there are regulations that need to be met. So this is uh, very important to consider as we look at deployments of devices and, and to connect them. So in this case, the user needs reliability, needs to make sure that uh, the remote care services is available at all times, cannot afford to have significant downtime. Uh, it's a very different uh, use case than, I would say, non-critical services, such as even a even an online bank service, uh, it, it, it is sometimes down for maintenance. Remote care service for medical needs to be up and running all the time. From an OEM perspective and the, the, the company that is providing the solution, what is really important is the predictable operating cost because their entire business model and how much they charge for this service will be based on that. So it sounds, uh, sounds pretty easy, right? Sounds uh, straightforward. Well, let's look at some of the challenges now that we may run into. So remember, we have the devices, we connect them, and now what we see is we have, depending on the use case, we looked at the two examples, we have many different kinds of devices that can be connected. We have sensors, we have machines, machineries, or equipment such as robots, or it could be PLCs or any, any devices in the industrial world. It could also be gateways, gateways that uh, can be an aggregator or can be a, a central function to manage devices that may not have the capability to connect to the cloud. So as we look at these, uh, first of all, the variety of devices, we see that the, the, sm the, the footprint may vary a lot from device to device. So when we think that um, there is enough room on a given device to install an agent, to install what is required to connect and manage a device, there might be some surprises because there are other parts of this uh, solution, other players, other partners, which may want to use this space for applications, applications on the device, for example. So it turns out that very often the, small, the footprint available for the device management functionality may be quite reduced. So that's one very common challenge that, that, we, that we meet. The second one that uh, uh, we already touched on earlier in this uh, discussion is the need to support multiple operating systems. What's interesting here, it's not just to, uh, to have coverage for multiple operating systems. It's actually the situation where a lot of real-life examples, deployments, they have multiple operating systems and multiple devices, multiple kinds of devices, in the same deployment, in the same application. So in, in some cases, at Wind River, we obviously have a, a, an entire portfolio of operating systems, but this is not sufficient for us because our customers are looking for more. Some of you on the phone today probably are looking for more. You're looking for maybe a, a Windows support, an Android support, in addition with all of the Windows supported OSs so that the experience and that the deployment can have one vendor to manage all these devices. The next uh, challenge that we see very frequently is the actual sheer volume of devices. How do we cope with having so many devices and if we want to even read an alert, we need to make sure that we have this alert in a certain amount of time. So when we are connected to only 10 devices, it's a very different situation than when we're connected to 10,000 devices. When we want to do a software upgrade, a software upgrade will need to be directed to a population of devices. So how long and how is it going to work out if we need to update a thousand devices at the same time? There are also some security threats to consider. So security is something where everything is fine in your deployment 
and from one day to the next, there's an announcement or there's a discovery of a security threat for a given operating system. This is something that needs to be monitored. This is something that needs to be ready to deploy very quickly to all vulnerable devices that are deployed. Then there are some um, other challenges, such as non-standard devices. Device management itself is not new. We've been doing this with uh, mobile devices, for example, for a long time, with uh, enterprise devices for a long time. One of the big difference with IoT is that these devices don't are, are used for many different use cases in, in very different situations, which means that the the depth of the the features and and ability that this um, device management solution must have in IoT is a lot more broad and a lot more deep. So some those are su just some of the examples of the challenges to consider. You can see that there are many more, um, and uh, Again, we can talk about this uh, for for a long time. I have a lot of a lot of uh, uh, stories and uh, anecdotes to uh, to talk about each of these boxes. So, if there are any questions at the end, I'd be happy to answer. So, on the next slide, some of you that are already deployed, I'm sure you you would relate to some of these uh, uh, bullet points. Where, what are the pitfalls? What do we need to avoid? What do we need to be conscious of as we embark into an IoT solution deployment? Well, first is the cost of upgrading software. We need to realize that uh, some of these devices may be in very inaccessible situation, very inaccessible areas. And so in making sure that not only we can have a device management and a software upgrade capability, but that it works in all cases is very important. I had an example where uh, some devices were located in an area where it was very cold. And so despite the fact that it was protected into a, an enclosure and into a, a semi-environmental friendly box, the temperature of the device went lower than expected and the devices stopped communicating. And so then it was in a very remote area and it cost a lot of money to go and, and get these devices up and running again. Also, when we deploy a, a system for the first time, it seems like it's bulletproof. It seems like we've done all of our testing, uh, we've done some staging, and now, as we deploy it and, and needs evolve in the long term, so for example, we may, not be, we may not be thinking that we'll ever need to update a certain portion of the software or a certain application. If we don't have that provision, we think we're covered, but when that need comes, we're going to need to have a dispatch and go and update these devices physically. Also, initially deployed systems, they may do what we expect them to do. But then once the complexity increases, with the volume increase, we can see some behaviors that are very different. That's where it's really important to have the ability to uh, monitor and to make sure we know what is happening where with all the population of devices throughout the process. Again, this is provided with some device management solutions. So for all of this, of course, we, uh, we, we, we get the theme now of, of the web, webinar. Device management is a key ingredient. It's a key ingredient not only to deploy the devices, it's not only in, in key to connect, but it's, in, it's very important for the ongoing success of a deployment. So let's talk a little bit more in details now on, on what device management is. Device management is really the art of staying connected. Again, we go back to why do we connect devices, and now that we know why, we want to know and make sure we're going to stay connected throughout the whole device lifecycle 
management. So it starts with deployment. We have to provision. We need to authenticate, make sure that the uh, cloud platform knows who is connecting, what device. Is it a legitimate device? Is it a secure device? Then we go on to the monitor area where we can start getting telemetry data to start with. We can have some status, some uh, alerts, things of that nature. Then we go to the service portion. This is really important when there's an issue to be able to diagnose remotely and to make a decision. Can we, can we repair remotely, maybe by sending an update, or do we need to dispatch a technician? Then we want to be able to manage the devices. That's really where we want to know what all of the properties, we want to know the device population, what is the, uh, uh, make sure they're all with uh, the right software version. We want to uh, keep uh, some tracking of potentially some updates that occurred. We want to know, for example, if um, out of a thousand devices, if to a group of 200, if they went to the version that they have now following each of the version increase increments, or if they had uh, a longer a longer gap in between. In other words, was there any time where some devices were not running on the same version? Things of that nature. As the system starts to have some, some uh, potential issue due to size and volume, we need to be able to track these elements. And then one of the most important part of, uh, of device management, the update. The ability to send new software images, the ability to uh, even do a, a kernel update. And if something goes wrong during that update, we want to be able to roll back and, and run a known good image. Finally, the decommissioning. When a device is no longer needed in a deployment, we need to think about not only making sure we physically recycle the device appropriately or redeploy it, we need to also think about all of the data, all of the sensitive information that has been generated on the device and in the cloud. And we need to dispose of either by erasing the information or backing it up onto a different system to keep as a history and, and make sure it's secure and, and the information cannot be leaked. So if we take an example to illustrate this uh, life cycle management. We have a factory automation deployment. So we have some sensors, we have gateways, we monitor the uh, status uh, of, uh, of the machinery. And the primary, the primary reason to have this, this is worldwide, and we want to know all the factories that, first of all, everything is up and running, that there, there are no issues. We want to know worldwide and also locally at each factory. And we want to have some information and do some predictive maintenance. So the way we do this during the deployment, of course, we're going to have to go and, and install uh, devices or, uh, or retrofit, add the connectivity functionality to existing devices, either through a, a bolt-on version, as we mention it. Oh, sorry, it advanced by itself. I'm going to go back. OK. So. It, um, I, I was mentioning so that uh, we, we, can, we can make sure that we can connect these, uh, these data and gather them. Then we're going to start monitoring. So we have data that we can forward to a third-party uh, analytics. Alarms and rules will uh, potentially trigger some corrective actions. We have the service aspect where if something goes wrong in one of the factory, we'll be able to remote log in and know if maybe there was uh, a problem with the software, maybe there was just a need to restart something, or if this is something more serious and requires uh, a corrective action. Again, this can also be triggered to a third-party uh, analytics, pre uh, predictive ana analytics company, so that we can use this uh, and to trigger some action, both from a physical perspective or back through the uh, uh, actuation through the device management platform. 
Then we have the manage aspect, so we want to make sure we know all of the devices. It's, a, it's an inventory of all, not only the devices that are connected, but the devices that are connected to these monitoring devices, and track all the versions uh, from it. Finally, we want to be able to do some updates. We want to have some staging capabilities. If we imagine that uh, a factory line will have some, uh, some robot, we want to make sure that they don't do anything unexpected. So we try it first, and then we push it. And then we'll do the decommissioning. I already mentioned it. So uh, we dispose of the data and the device or redeploy them. So now this is a, a very short and high level now we talked about all of the, the, the why we want to connect them. We talked about what is the life cycle. Now we want to talk about what the product looks like. How is the product architectured? So here we have, um, this is time to include, to introduce our, our product. It's called Helix Device Cloud, which is our management, device management solution. And we can see on the red side where we have the devices, this is where our agent resides. Then we have a secure connectivity to the cloud and our device cloud platform. What's important to note is we want to be flexible. We don't necessarily need to have the telemetry going through our system. We're happy to provide only uh, the device management, uh, in other words, the control aspect of it. And we have APIs that go to enterprise IT or cloud service providers or analytics uh, providers to have cloud applications and services that can leverage the device management capability that we provide. And also we want to make sure that we have the appropriate security. So the security is not only for the connectivity, it's also once it's stored in the cloud that throughout the life cycle, the data is secure, and that we also ensure there are no intrusion and there are no, all of the device authentication aspect starts from the time we are creating and deploying the devices to the time it's decommissioned, so that we can avoid things like uh, people coming in with a device and, and pretending that they are part of this network. This is a, a little bit of a, a more detailed view of the architecture. I just wanted to point out here that what's important from an agent perspective, we mentioned some of the challenges earlier. The portability is really important, meaning that the same agent can run on many different kinds of devices. This is very important so that our customers can easily connect their e their existing devices, or even if they are new devices, to make sure they have a solution to quickly bring them onto the network and connect them to the cloud. And then on the management platform side, on the cloud side, this is where we want to be able to handle high volumes of devices. The actual architecture at this level doesn't really represent that, but it's one of the most important aspect of a device management solution. The ability to not only be able to provide um, uh, a small amount of devices and to, to manage a small amount of devices, but also a bigger, larger population of devices. So we talked about device management and some of the very basic and high-level features. Now I want to take a step back a little bit. So as you are deploying solutions with device management, WinRiver can help you in a few uh, ways that are, not, that are covered by device management but not necessarily linked to device management only. Again, when we deploy an IoT solution, we need to make sure that we look at the entire value of the solution, not only at the value of specific ingredients. And we'd like to always keep that in mind when we engage with customers. So for example, we can accelerate time to market by having agents supporting multiple devices, multiple OSs. We can decrease the risk because we have already deployments with a large volume of devices connected. 
we can make sure that we avoid field visits by really uh, anticipating some of the challenges that are coming up. We, need to, we can also make sure that IoT solutions will have a reduced downtime. Through device management, it is really important to ensure that devices are always up and running. So if you're planning to deploy connected devices and you, you may be concerned about what happens when your remote devices stop talking, you may want to think about your overall operating expenses. You may want to have some thoughts of creating new revenue streams and, and maybe disrupt the business that you're in. All of that requires devices to be connected at all times. So with that, if you want to, uh, to know more and go into more details in what I presented, I'd be very happy to, uh, uh, to discuss this offline. So feel free to contact us. So Jeremy, with that, I will uh, open it up for questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Joel. There's uh, certainly plenty for us to chew over. Um, we'll go to questions in a moment. Um, there are some. Uh, there is a poll that we're going to do before we do that, um, and the poll um, is appearing on your screen now. Um, it asks, "Are you looking to IoT as an extension of your current business?" Or are you looking to disrupt new markets with IoT? And the choice there is extension of current business or disruption of new markets. So are you looking to IoT as an extension of your current business or are you looking to disrupt new markets with IoT? Let's see what people say. Very evenly split. 46.7% uh, say that this is an extension of their current business, and 53.3% say it's their intention to disrupt new markets. And I find that fascinating that there's such a close division between the two. Um, Joel, is that, again, what you expected? Yeah, I was expecting that there would be maybe a little bit more of the uh, disrupting new markets. Uh, so it, it is more. I was expecting maybe more of a 70-30 or 65-35 split. So, uh, right. but very interesting result. Very interesting. Well, it, it, perhaps it reflects the nature of our audience. I don't know. Um, we'd have to do further research to know that. But um, Robin, is that the sort of thing that you've come to see? Yes, I mean, uh, IoT and the introduction of IoT is uh, potentially very disruptive uh, and. Uh, gives an opportunity to uh, enter. Uh, it might be uh, existing markets in a different way, or it might be completely new markets. Um, so uh, people may be thinking of uh, um, not so much an extension of current business, but uh, a redefinition of, uh, of current business. Might be, they might be considering that to be a disruption. Uh, so there's that to consider as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, time is short, and I'm very keen to get to the welter of questions we've had, which has been fantastic. Keep them coming in. Uh, we will be able to get our um, panelists to respond to you directly offline if we don't get to your question. Um, there are so many, I'm going to whisk through them as fast as possible. Um, this really is for you, Joel. Um, a sensing company wants to know, can you elaborate on the concept of a, quote, standard device, unquote, or a non-standard one, as you mentioned in slide 17? Yeah, very good, uh, very good question. So uh, a standard device is something like a, like a smartphone. It's a device where we know exactly what, uh, what it does. Uh, it's used for very similar purposes, even though there are different flavors, there are different OSs, it remains in the same type of use case. Uh, Non-standard is, uh, is something that uh, may be purpose-built for either if it's for a battery life, if it's for a, a power consumption, uh, if it's for uh, being, something being ruggedized, and that has some implications on the design, whether it's the footprint, whether it's the weights used, 
So as an example, a, a non-standard device could be a device that can only be uh, down uh, for a um, uh, for an upgrade for a very short period of time versus a cell phone where you'd be able to reboot your cell phone and users will accept the fact that you have to reboot your cell phone and that you may you may lose maybe a minute of of, uh, of functionality. So that's what I mean by standard versus non-standard. Yeah, you, you mentioned OSs there, and there have been a couple of questions about OSs. Here, here's one. Um, what do you mean by multiple OSs in a single IoT space, and can you give an example? So let's let's reuse the example of uh, of, of the pay stations. There may be uh, a company that has pay stations in, in the field today, there might be different types of pay stations. There might be portable, mobile ones, and they all want to be connected to the same device management uh, uh, platform. So in this case, we may have a smaller footprint or a device that has different security uh, requirements run different OSs, but they all end up being connected to the same platform. Yeah. Um, here's a, a question from a, a leading association, a te telecoms association, um, saying the poll taken at the beginning is interesting. What is the demographic of companies on the call? Um, since we don't know exactly who's going to turn up uh, on the day, we can't say in advance, so I don't have uh, figures to hand. But to help you all understand, there is a very even split in our um, audience historically, and I see no reason to believe it won't be the same today. I've just had a quick look uh, online and see the people who, take, who are taking part between vendors and developers with a slightly smaller number of end users, but still a growing number there. So uh, I hope that answers the question there. Um, there's a, a, an independent um, person uh, doesn't give themselves as being from any particular company, wants to know Currently, device management is specific for each device manufacturer. Do you see a standardization of the way a device is managed? Uh, that's a very good question. I think that uh, there will be first, so again, this is my own opinion, uh, there will be first some standardization on some, uh, some, some interfaces or protocols, but I think it will take, uh, it will take a long time until there is an actual uh, device management standard. However, that being said, this is where it depends where we put the um, where we put the device management functionality. If we consider that uh, uh, REST APIs can uh, uh, can be considered as the entry point in the cloud to device management through a particular vendor, uh, there may be over time some uh, some uh, standard uh, REST APIs or other sorts of, of APIs for, for, for that matter. But I, I, at this point, it's uh, definitely still, there are many different associations, uh, many different standard bodies that are, that are emerging, but not, it's going to take some time until the industry really uh, narrows down on, on some standards. Robin, you see the whole picture quite well from uh, your vantage point. Is there anything you'd add to that? Not really, no. I think um, I think uh, um, Joel is is absolutely right. It's going to take a while for that to uh, to happen. I mean, what we're what we're what we're finding, of course, is that there are, are more devices and more platforms uh, appearing uh, all the time. So, uh, uh, providing some sort of standardisation to that is is not uh, something that's going to happen very quickly. Uh, it's got to get ahead of the market, and the market, of course, is moving as as fast as it can without that. So. Uh, I'm not sure that I see a particular opportunity for uh, standardization to uh, take hold. Yeah. Um, a German uh, delegate would like to know this, Joel. Do you consult with customers by choosing the preferred device transportation protocol too? Um, he gives the examples of LoRaWAN and Zigbee, etc. Well, we engage with uh, with our customers, and uh, we we try to meet the, their requirements, and we try to to use in our platform uh, at first the most common protocols, and and uh, but yes, we do we do consult, uh, and but most of the time it's really it's really a matter of uh, either we do a, a customization on the device side, and and it depends. 
what we're talking in terms of the Zigbee, Zigbee connection, for example, where does that, what, what is that Zigbee connection connecting? Is it a sensor to a gateway? Is it, uh, uh, is it a different type of connection? So it, it, it depends. That's the, the short answer. Uh, but, uh, but yes, definitely we engage with our customers to, uh, to figure out what, what is required. Yeah. Uh, similarly, somebody wants to know, does, uh, do you have a Helix in the box platform on a hyper-converged infrastructure? I mean, you, you kind of touched on that. I'm not sure I understand the, uh, the, the question. Uh, the, the question is um, on, regarding on-premise device management. Uh, okay. Do you have a Helix in the box platform on a hyper-converged infrastructure? And if that's one that you'd rather take offline when we can give it a bit more time to consider, we can always do that. There's certainly no shortage of other questions. No, I can, I can answer it. So, so this, is, uh, this is something that we're considering. We don't have it today. Uh, we are uh, really focusing right now uh, in, in the, uh, the SaaS aspect of uh, device management. And one of the reasons is because uh, one related question, what, what, what is, where is the industry going? What is the standardization? We find that having the bigger focus we have, the more chances of success and the, more, the quicker we can, we can build and grow our business. So this is, this is the reason why we don't want to, um, uh, we, we want to make sure we, we focus on, on something very tangible first. Yeah. Um, a question here uh, about a company that's very much in the news at the moment. Um, the questioner asks, companies like Arm and Microsoft are heavily behind LW M2M protocols for device management. What's your take on it? Yeah, it's definitely uh, a, a very common, a very uh, one of the protocols that seem to be emerging as uh, as as a common denominator. Um, you also mentioned partners that you provide access to via APIs. Um, questioner here wants to know what partners you're referring to. So this is um, this is mostly uh, again this is this is something where there there are no there are no limits on who could potentially uh, access our product through our REST APIs. But we are cur currently focusing on uh, companies that are providing applications in the cloud or or some sort of uh, uh, cloud services, uh, which could include uh, hosting services. It could include analytics or it could include more vertical uh, industry specific solutions um, there's a question I've been dying to ask and since I've got the microphone for a moment I w I'm going to um, since we're still in the early stages of most IOT deployments uh, you mentioned uh, decommissioning at the end of the life, life cycle should we really be worrying about that now is that um, is that something that we should be taking into consideration from the outset? Yeah, we, sh we should because, uh, again, this is something that we need to know uh, where the data is stored, how it is handled, and, and if we don't know how it's going to be decommissioned, we may not be ready for that when, when the time comes. So uh, it's uh, essentially and, – and also keep in mind that decommissioning could also be – uh, when, uh, let's say, there's a, a deployment of 10,000 devices and for a short period of time there's going to be only 8,000 devices needed until it goes back up to 15,000, uh, there's also a decommissioning at that moment. So it, it could come much sooner than, uh, than you think. Um, can you throw your mind back to slide 22, Joel? Um, somebody wants to know what you mean by the word agent. Um, and why is it uh, important in portability? So the agent is really the, uh, the software that runs on the device that allows the uh, cloud device management platform to connect and manage that device. Uh, so the agent has some, not, only, not only the uh, technology to connect, it also has all of the intelligence to perform certain certain actions, uh, such as uh, device actuation. Uh, the reason why it's uh, important for to have the portability is because for us as a as a 
device management solution provider, we need to make sure that we can connect to many devices uh, with different environments, different OSs. And so we want to make sure that we can be very quick to respond to the market requirements, which is evolving every day. And that's the reason why it needs to be uh, portable. Now, if, uh, if, if someone wanted to, do, to uh, build an agent for a specific use case, and this would be the use case that would be the entire uh, uh, market that this this company would go after, then of course the portability would uh, uh, need would would not be as important. But for us, we want to make sure that we can be on as many devices as possible uh, on the edge. In fact, we already have uh, deployed over over one or two billion devices, depending on how how we count, uh, of, of Wind River OSs that run on devices out there. So this is a, a, an example. All these devices could, could get connected at some point, and we want to make sure that we have a very portable agent that will work with these devices. Um, there's a, a question here from uh, somebody in the Middle East who wants to know, uh, particularly about the monitor, monitoring stage, uh, what kind of data can be used for analytics? Uh, he's referring to security or software or digital so what kind of data can be used for analytics um, in slide 20? So uh, we, we provide the, uh, the ability to, uh, to bring telemetry data, so any data that uh, gets um, gathered and, and uh, uh, stored on the device can be, can be pushed uh, to the cloud. This, is, uh, this could be data of... Um, Vibration data, for example, which is very important in uh, predictive, anal predictive maintenance type applications. It could be alarms. It could be temperature. It could be um, position coordinates. It's it's just uh, infinite the number of, of of types of data. And and the way we transport this data is is pretty transparent. So we don't. We don't necessarily um, uh, do advanced uh, uh, analytics on this data. We, we want to make sure we provide a secure pipe that we provide it to third parties so that they can really unleash the, uh, the value and the details and, and the information included in this data. Okay. Um, we've barely got time for uh, any more. I've probably got time for two if I confine you to 30-second answers. So sorry about that, Joel, but if there's anything more you need to say, you can always take it offline with the uh, questioner. Um, okay. Can your device stacks work with third-party device clouds? At this point, no. Because, and the reason for that is we want to make sure we have a really uh, an end-to-end -end for security reasons, for functionality reasons. We want to have our technology on the device and, and in the cloud, but we are happy to uh, interact with the rest of the applications in the cloud. Okay, and finally, um, how is the how is updating managed uh, either SaaS or in-house in cases where, due to security reasons, there's a closed loop network, i.e., uh, not being able to access the internet? I I would have to take that one offline. Yeah, fair enough. It's quite a detailed one. Uh, I, I'm afraid we're out of time, ladies and gentlemen. We've done really well, and thank you so much for all of your questions. The aim of this webinar has, after all, been to learn how to uncover some of the hidden value of IoT with device management, and I think we've done it with the panel today. We've heard about some of the challenges like security, like large data volumes, and managing service level agreements. I've got my own service level agreement to try and meet in order to keep this to an hour, so we have to go. Don't forget to keep an eye on our website at iot-now.com. And in the next 48 hours, you will be able to stream this webinar from our site. And don't forget to bookmark it because really there's nowhere better to find the latest news, blogs, and videos. It just remains for me to say, a huge thank you to our speakers, Robin Duke Woolley of Beecham Research. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Yeah, great. And to Joel Emery of Wind River Helix Management Platform. Thank you, Joel. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone.
been great to have you both. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us. Keep safe, and we really do appreciate the time you've spent with us. From everyone here at IOT Now, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.